and I have two grand dogs. <laughs> and I think he'd appreciate that. And so in preparing for the service today, there was a thought that struck me, what passage would really make us want to shout snap as we look at Scripture? And what better way to begin for us to look at Psalm 90? And I've chosen selected verses. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were born or brought forth before you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death, they are like new grass in the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. Our days may come to 70 years, or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Satif satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Teach us, O Lord, to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. I find it significant that the family have chosen hymns that, were, that Trevor chose, I'm sure, for his mother's memorial, which was led by the Reverend Andre Butner, who is with us today. But at that memorial, this particular hymn seems to hit the sweet spot. It was written by Horatio Spafford, and when he wrote this hymn, he wrote out of a deep feeling of grief because he was a wealthy businessman in Chicago. There had been a fire in 1871, and at the same time he lost a four-year-old son to scarlet fever. And so in his grief, he sent his wife and his four girls, remaining four girls, on a sea cruise to England. And the story, as we all know, tells of a mid-Atlantic collision. And Spafford lost all four daughters, but his wife survived. And I think that this story takes us to the heart of grief. It takes us to the heart of feeling bewildered and hurt. And Trevor... His spirit certainly lives on. We invite our organist to lead us as we sing these familiar verses. <clears throat> Peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say It is well it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. We turn to the second last verse. But, Lord, tis for Thee, for Thy coming we wait. 
the sky, not the grave is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And the last verse. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. The congregation, please be seated. So let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. It was you, O Lord, who scratched light across the surface of darkness. It was you, Lord, who swept across the face of the sea. It was you, Lord, who called us into being and made us your people. The story is old, yet it is ever new. Kept in faith, kept by faith. The story surrounds our senses, for we remember hearing the laughter of Sarah, seeing old Moses climbing mountains, dry bones rising up, and we marvel at the touch of God's grace. We thank you, O Lord, for being our God in ages past and for years to come. For your story is strong and vibrant. And so we ask that you would comfort us who mourn. May your word awaken us all today to put our whole trust in your goodness and mercy. For we confess that Trevor's death has left us numbed and shocked. And although COVID has helped us come to terms with our own mortality, not seeing him again in this life is hard to accept. And so we celebrate the love that he has shown, the good that he has done. We rejoice in his faith in you. And we are assured that you break into our lives as strength, granting us wings like eagles, encouraging us to run and not be weary, to walk and not faint, reminding us that in Christ Jesus nothing can separate us from your love. You bring patterns into our days. A child is born, the first day at school, the driver's licenses, graduation, marriage, new jobs, birthdays and promotions, departures, retirement planning, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. 
And so, Lord, in the spirit of the psalmist, help us to treat each day as a gift from You, to live each day as if it were our last. When we face separation and loneliness, grant a listening ear and a gentle touch. Draw near to us. Provide still waters for those trapped in whirlpools of stress and depression. Encouragement when discouragement drags us down. May your story become our story. And so this morning we pray that you would open us to the wonder and the beauty of humanity. That you would open us to the dignity of diversity in each face and in each experience. And as we celebrate Trevor's life and talk about his ministry, fill us, we pray, with generosity. Heal the divisions. Show us the way. Bring us understanding, inspiration, wisdom, and the courage to embrace the days which lie ahead. For we ask this in and through the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. I think for our online community, we have to say that the family have really put together a gorgeous portfolio of Trevor's life. And I'm sure many of you are able to look at those pictures and shout snap at them as you retell or as you begin to tell your own story and remember with affection all that he has meant to us. But what better way to set the ball rolling than ask the two young men in his life to come forward and talk about their dad. I think it's great when you see two names. You have a name... Uh, you have a name of Paul, and you have a name of Wesley. And I think, I think your dad probably said they were both good writers, Paul and Wesley. Paul was the letter writer, Wesley was the journalist. So it's over to you guys. There we go. This one, that one? Yeah. Which one? That one. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off by saying pretty much what uh, Reverend Hillebrand said. It's, uh, when I thought of coming up here today, it was a bit of a surreal feeling. Um, for us as a family, you know, events like this that are notable, whether it be a memorial service, a wedding, or a baptism, is normally where my dad would stand up and take the reins and guide us through. This is something I noticed from a very young age. I noticed my dad taking the reins in these situations, and it was always evident how strong he was. The last few of these occasions, just to mention those that were notable for our family, um, I mean, the first one was my wife's uncle, his memorial service. My dad performed the memorial service back in 2010. Uh, my dad married myself and Haley back in 2013. It was wonderful to have him perform the ceremony. He baptized our first grandchild, well, his first grandchild, Julia, um, back in 2015. He facilitated his own mother's memorial in 2016, my grandmother. My dad also baptized his youngest grandchild, Lillian, in 2018. And lastly, he shepherded us through a small memorial for his own father, my grandfather, back in 2020. My wife, Haley, wrote a beautiful poem for my dad once we heard he was sick. She sent it th through to him. I'd just like to take a small piece of it. She wrote, strength is defined as a state of being physically strong, but not you. Strength is defined as constancy, as patience, as presence, as knowledge, as dependable. And that is how we experienced him. He's always been that kind of strength for us and the right kind of pillar of strength and brought so many people together, as I know he has for so many people here. Being back here at Paro brings back so many memories of my dad and being with my dad. And the one memory that I always think about is every Christmas morning. I would get so excited, obviously more excited about the Christmas gifts, but 
mainly, secondly, should I say, because of his stories that he would tell. The reason we got so excited, he'd take an ordinary time of our lives and just incorporate it into a beautiful Christmas message. I remember simple things such as my brother and I panicking on Christmas Eve. We couldn't find our cat Jojo, as cats go missing, we all know. We, you know, we would stand up and say, no, we're not going to have Christmas without Jojo, and then she would miraculously appear, as cats do. Another story I remember him pulling out on Christmas Day was a, f a neighborhood friend of ours bringing us a gift on Christmas Eve. This was a day after he threatened to hit us with a spade for looking over the wall of his house. And probably my favorite one was a story that my dad, I, I think he was standing over here, um, for months him and my mom were looking for a pair of pants for him. And finally they found this miraculous pair of pants that satisfied every need. And my dad actually brought it on Christmas Day. He threw it over the podium, sort of to show his excitement of these pants, and went on to illustrate how the shop store people were basically standing on each side of the store, clapping as he walked out with his fists raised in the air in triumph. Um, I don't know what the story of that or the moral of that one was. Maybe it was to have faith, but um, I, I, probably pretty close. This was typical of my dad's imagination and sense of humor that we love so much and something I try to emulate with my own girls. Lastly, from my side, I try to think of one person that didn't or wasn't fond of my father. I don't know of a single person. Guys that I haven't seen at school, and I've been out of school now for 20 years, um, they normally ask me how my dad is before they ask me how I am. So it just shows you what an impact he made being present at every sort of cricket and rugby match, and even the practices. So when Mark explained what people would say about my father on Facebook, I tried to have a little short sentence of what he was. And yes, self-effacing is certainly the first one that comes to mind, but also gentle, brilliant, insightful, and a wonderful, dry sense of humor. Thanks so much. I'll pass over to my brother. Hi everyone. Um, those who, who knew my dad well remember he had quite a unique sense of humor. I remember his many funny skits at church camps were a testament to that and always a highlight to many in attendance and I think particularly for Paul and myself, maybe a bit less so for my mom. She was always a bit nervous that my dad would embarrass her or say something somewhat inappropriate. But as Paul just said, he at times he displayed a very dry sense of humor. It's going to be very funny for those who understand that kind of humor or appreciate that kind of humor, but occasionally my dad would come across people who hadn't the faintest idea when he was trying to be funny or if he was trying to be funny. And I, I think, you know, my dad, my dad wished that it wouldn't bother him when people didn't find him funny or, or when they didn't understand his humor. I remember on more than one occasion he he mentioned an incident where he was chatting to a, a very junior colleague of his when attempting his classic sort of straight face sense of humor with this colleague. The guy just looked at my father with a perplexed look on his face and he just eventually said, you weird. <laughs> but I know us as a family, I know this was true of many other people as well. We always enjoyed my dad's sense of humor. I can remember Memory, many, many family get-togethers where my grandparents and my aunt were listening intently to my dad's every word as he was recounting a funny story or experience. I think really that um, half the fun was just the way my dad told the story or funny story, uh, just the way he would react to it, that his reaction in itself was so contagious that we just couldn't help but laugh along for example, I remember many times saying to my brother, oh, there's something quite funny I would like you to see. There's maybe a funny clip. And I'd, I'd play it for my brother, and I'd be laughing along. And then I'd look at my brother, and my brother didn't seem amused in the slightest. So a few moments later, I'd call my dad into the room with my brother. I'd play the same clip, and eventually my dad would start rubbing his hands together and laughing and eventually throwing his head back in amusement. And then I'd look at Paul, and Paul would be looking at my dad, and Paul would... <laughs> Suddenly Paul would be laughing, and I, I'd say to my brother afterwards, why do you wait for dad to laugh, to laugh yourself? And he would say, yeah, but it's actually dad's reaction that I find 
funnier than anything else. And I think, yeah, in that way, my dad's demeanor and his laugh was, was very contagious. My dad was also more than able to withstand some light-hearted teasing from my brother and I. We would often refer to his doctoral thesis, and we would say, Dad, have, has anybody ever managed to decipher what you were going on about in that thesis of yours? I remember saying to him, Dad, what I like about your thesis is it's a nice thick book, so nice and thick, which can be quite useful if you ever come across it in a library. You can use it to stand on to reach for a better book. <laughs> and my dad would just go along with the joke, keep a straight face, nod along, and true, very true. <laughs> Seeing my aunt and uncle here today, I also remember quite recently saying to my father, yeah, Dad, isn't a coincidence that my cousin is an anaesthetist, my aunt and uncle's daughter. She's an anaesthetist, whereas you're a preacher, and although those are very different occupations, you ended up doing the same thing as her, putting people to sleep. <laughs> so again, my dad would, would just keep a straight face and Paul and I would often refer to the story of Eticus in the Bible. Eticus was a young man who, uh, due to the lengthy duration of the Apostle Paul's sermon, Eticus actually fell asleep, perhaps out of boredom. Paul and I would say to my father, isn't it a coincidence that there was a very similar incident during one of your sermons? The only difference being, in this particular instance, the congregation member was so bored by your sermon that he willingly Sorry, I actually need to backtrack. Eticus, Eticus, yeah, he, he fell asleep during the Apostle Paul's sermon and actually fell out the window of a three-story building. Yeah, that was rather important information I for, forgot to include. Yeah, he, he, he was so bored by the sermon, he fell asleep um, and he fell out of a three-story building to his death. So the joke was with my father. We said, wasn't it such a coincidence that a similar incident occurred during one of your sermons, except in this case, the congregation member was so bored that he willingly jumped out of the window <laughs> to his death. And again, my father would just nod along and say something perhaps along the lines of, yes, I remember that very well. <laughs> so yeah, there were, there were always um, a few other tried and tested jokes that we would hear from my father, one of the, 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 one of the jokes that was commonly used was to the, to the point where Paul and I would perhaps roll our eyes when listening to it, but if my father was even at, at an event or a function of some kind and he was asked to say a prayer or perhaps at a, a meal gathering and he was asked to say grace, then my dad would say the prayer and then Paul and I knew what was coming next. Immediately after the prayer, my dad would look up and say, okay, now I'm going to take a collection. <laughs> While that occasionally got some laughs, Paul and I would always look at each other as if to say, oh, no, not this joke again. Not this. <laughs> you know, so my dad was always, he was always able to, to laugh at himself. I'm not sure if many others would find it funny, but I remember particular story, I don't know why I remember it, but I remember a particular story where he was telling me how he was going, walking through town, going about some daily chores, when he came across a lady who, who knew him as a minister, and she, she asked him if he was able to fill in a particular form and, and make a small donation to a particular charity. My dad said that he was more than happy to oblige, filled in the form, filled in his details, and then made a donation, and then, according to my dad, he then said to her, I'm sorry I can't give more, but I'm a poor minister. And then, according to my dad, she replied by saying, Yes, I know, I've heard your sermons. <laughs> so again, I'm sure the second part of that story is not true, but it's just the kind of thing that my dad knew I would find funny. And I think it's a, the kind of humor that's really typical of him. I must say, though, that I, I found it to be quite a daunting task trying to 
summarize for you today some of the humor that was typical of my dad. Um, I don't feel that I could ever do him justice in doing so. I do I also did find it quite difficult thinking back, trying to trying to remember specific funny moments involving my father, trying to remember exactly what he said, how he said it that made me laugh so much. All I, all I can think though is that one needs to one needs to reminisce with family and friends. And in doing so, we can share fond memories of my father. Um, share my, rediscover what made him cherished by so many. And ultimately keep the memory of him alive for years to come. Let's give him a good clap. I'm going to read selected verses from the letter of Paul to the Philippians and from the Gospel of Matthew. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Therefore I say unto you, be not anxious for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Is not life more than food? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. O ye of little faith, be not therefore anxious. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill of the living God fall afresh on me. The life of Trevor John Ruthenberg was all about spirit. He tried to put it into writing in his doctoral thesis on Christian spirituality and a broader perspective. And that spirit is a spirit that we celebrate here together as family and as friends. Ever since Trevor left Thornton, it has been my duty to go and make visits to him up the West Coast and do the Sabbath day's journey to go and find him and track him down and meet him at the coffee shop, particularly the village coffee shop, and just have conversation and then to go to the home and see him. But it was the bishop's letter that really prompted me to get hold of one of the colleagues, one of his colleagues from Rhodes University, Gavin Leverton, who's with us here today. And the two of us made our pilgrimage to Oakmont Road in Sunningdale to go and see the Ruth. And that was our nickname for Trevor. We called him the Ruth. And I guess that when you look at that word, there are some pointers that help us in our tribute here this morning. The first in that letter, in the acronym, is the spirit of respect. And there's a sense in which we stand before God today and we honor our parents. Trevor's dad was a tradesman, a blacksmith who melted steel and made horseshoes and tore the ligaments in his wrists. 
His dad loved soccer, athletics, and his workshop. There you would find him making wooden toys, dolls' houses, and repairing anything that was broken. I remember visiting his folks and having a good conversation with his dad and mom at the old home at number eight, Acacia Way in Thornton. Glynis remembers very well her folks chatting to my folks after a morning service at the Thornton Methodist Church a long time ago, Glynis. Our roots run deep and we honor our heritage. Trevor knew the rules and inherited the values of kindness and love and friendship in that home. And those values have stayed with him all his life. Moving to Rhodes marked the first significant break up of the family. Trevor began to take root and grow, stretching his mind and deepening his faith, and lifelong friendships were formed. In 1979, he landed up in Springs, and I think Anne knew that the Ruth was serious when he came to say goodbye to her after a Friday night guild meeting on her memorable trip to Europe and beyond. He came to say goodbye to you when you went off to London and Oberammergau and to Germany and Italy and Israel. And not to be undone, he went overseas, just one trip overseas in 1981, and he visited Israel. Reverend Harry Irons and Neville Micklethwaite, who incidentally turned 80 on Sunday, made sure that the knot was tight in July 1982. Working with Viv Harris in Brackpan for the next seven years strengthened his resolve and understanding of his calling. Celebrating the arrival of Paul and Wesley sealed the deal for Trevor. And the rest is history. 17 years here at the Paro Methodist Church, three years in Mafeking, seven years in Thornton, Respect, respect. Respect is a feeling of deep admiration for someone or something elicited by their attributes or qualities and achievements. Respect is something that we honor in our memory here today of Trevor. Trevor could disagree respectfully but always throw out a challenge. He could show gratitude and compliment the achievements of other people. Trevor could let you know that you mattered as a human being. I loved the way that he asked questions. What makes you say that, he would say. He trained himself as an academic to be specific in his critique. Trevor could hold center stage, and today we acknowledge our respect. And even if you didn't enjoy the jokes, he still gets our respect. And I think that for both Gavin and I, there was a moment in our lives that we realized that Trevor was dealing with the end game. There was an oxygen tank, they'd come to replace it, and he was struggling to converse with us. And I realized that this disease had really taken hold of his body. And in conversation, just two days later, I went for a meal with a couple who are known to us within the Cape District, Jenny and Ermel Kirby. She was Jenny Sweet. And Jenny coined a phrase that I found incredibly helpful. She said, you know, Mark, Trevor was a most unusual man. And that second word in Ruth for the you, the unusual, seems to stick for me. I suppose he was a good Methodist because he was a non-conformist. He was someone who was part of the free church movement. He was someone who began to say to us, look again at what's in front of you. And I think that Jenny's words echo so much about our thoughts of Trevor. Trevor was interesting and remarkable, extraordinary. Not what people would expect. 
teaching us to look between the lines, teaching us to think out of the box, surprising us. A rare person, a rare human being, differing from the normal. And I'm glad that Wesley was able to just highlight some of the humor. I think we all have our stories of the way in which Tevin, uh, a way in which Trevor be able, was able to give us that, a belly full of laughter. It was his wicked sense of humor that caught our attention. I always remember the trip to Maffa King. He had phoned me up earlier on and I said to me, you know, guess where the church, and this is what ministers always say, especially in itinerant ministry, guess where the church has sent me. And I said, no, Trevor, where? He said, to Maffa King. And I said, are you serious? And he said, yes. And he really said, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this one. But off he went. And I'm told that the family traveled up minus the boys because they stayed with Glynis. And the family was separated. And off you went. But the pets went with. And you stayed over in, 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 in the Traveler's Church, which my dad called both at West, West Methodist Church, courtesy of Rodney Baumeister. And you stayed over and you eventually made your way to Maffa King. What struck me was the story of the arrival of this family car in Maffa King, this desolate, tired, tired, tired town. And Trevor mused about the experience, and he drove through. He tried to get a feel for the context of this new space and this new appointment. And he said, you know, I came across the cinema, the local cinema in Maffa King, and he said, I looked at this place. He said, it was closed up. It was dusty. It was dirty. I don't know when they had last shown a movie. But he said, I looked at the notice board. And I thought about my ministry and how I was going to attach myself to this community. Because on the notice board was the last movie that was shown. But unfortunately, the poster had already dropped down and it was upside down. So I looked underneath and I said, there's the title, Superman Returns. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a classic. That's an absolute classic of Trevor at work. And if we were true today, we would say, let's put a fridge magnet on our fridges and say, don't be afraid of being different. Be afraid of being the same as everyone else. We thank God for Trevor, the unusual and it's a spirit that lives on in our hearts. I would probably say also unique, but you can go into your own little journey in your mind and say to yourself, what are my thoughts? What do we think? And it's this question of his ability to be able to think on his feet and also to be able to stretch our minds, as we said earlier on, deepen our faith. And so Gavin posed the question on our Boxing Day meeting. Gavin looked at Trevor and he looked at me and he said, name one person from the Bible who you would invite to a coffee shop. And Mark, true to his spirit, I just belted out and I said, well, I would love to have Thomas at my coffee shop meeting because Thomas was honest and he was open and he just asked all the difficult questions. Gavin was a bit reserved and eventually I had to get that answer out of him at a later time, but he said, you know, maybe my character that I would like to meet at the coffee shop would be Moses. So I said, well, Gavin, that's not a bad thought. But in all of this, I looked at Trevor out the corner of my eye, and he didn't say a word. But I could see his mind working over time. And I think that Trevor would have settled for a person called Ruth, not just because of his name, but that he would have pointed us to the first chapter in Matthew's gospel in the eighth verse and said, honor your heritage. Look at Ruth. Look at the Ruth, if you like. Appreciate your history. Look at where you have come from and the story that brings you to this point in your life. And he would have delighted to have talked about the great-grandmother of King David and traced the lineage to the source of our celebration today. Because Ruth is the story 
of people remaining true to character when society is crumbling and collapsing. Ruth is the story of a classic example of love and loyalty. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. It's the story about justice. It's a story about a way for widows and orphans and the poor and foreigners. It's the story of the means for caring. And they adopt the word called gleaning, scavenging for food that keeps them alive. And I could hear Trevor probably saying to us today, so what did you glean today? What did you pick? What takeaways did you get from this service here in Pero as you gave thanks to God for my life and for the years of my ministry? It's that spirit that makes us say, teach us, O Lord, to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And if any guiding thought holds us, it's that thought that gives us a sense of strength and encouragement. But it's the last letter that really puts it all together for us. And it's great that we are here in Paro. It was lovely to speak to Esme the other day. And if you really want to know what goes on in the history of this church, speak to Esme. She will tell you that she was baptized in this church and she knows every story about everybody here. Such good secretary you are. So thank you, Esme, for reminding us of this home of the Ruthenbergs and how difficult it was for you that when you left, the Ruthenbergs left this place like a number of pews were empty after that because you moved on and that was quite tough for them back home. But when we got back together at Oakmont Road with the family and this was just meeting with, um, with Anne and the boys, the question was raised, where would the service be conducted? And Anne openly said, look, I want a big church. I know the COVID regulations are upon us, but I'd like a church to accommodate us under these adjusted regulations for as many people as possible. And it's good that we are here. It's good that we're in the space that literally gave him his doctoral thesis, that made him who he was. Trevor really felt at home in the sanctuary. We saw it in the tributes here today. But he also felt at home watching rugby, especially a game of rugby. Boca, home with his family, at home with his books, at home in the coffee shop. When we looked at the two lads coming here, I said to them, well, Paul, he was the great letter writer when you look at scripture and you referred to it admirably in your talks. But Philippians was written to the first church that, that Paul established on European soil. Paul was in prison. And like Trevor, he was troubled by opposition and disturbed by the false teachings that were so prevalent in his day. But the message is so clear to us as the people of God as we begin to say to ourselves, Lord, what is the secret of this life? The secret is simply that we need to be still and have a humble outlook of Jesus. We need to place emphasis on joy and confidence and unity and perseverance. And when we live in the joy of the Lord, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in sync. It's as simple as that. Jesus says, consider, think about all these things. And that's what Trevor made us do. He took us home. And that's when it gets tough for us because in many ways we've seen the signs of the kingdom in Trevor's life. We've seen them expressed and after this service you'll have your own conversation. In fact, we could stand in this, in this courtyard afterwards and be here for the rest of the week. So deep is the root. But he has brought us home to home. He's brought us home to home to home truths on so many occasions. And here we are today, trying to piece together a remarkable life. 
And we are glad that his story is part of our story. He was passionate about spirituality, examining and finding the spiritual practice that seems right for people in an ever-changing world of change and doubt. His fascination with words and the power of story will never leave us. We will miss hearing him make that speech on Christmas Day. We will miss hearing him speak to us about some of those stories that meant so much to him. Watching little Julie wonder, Julia wonder why Grandpa couldn't open the Coke bottle on Christmas Day because he was just too weak. Remembering how he drew everyone together. Listening to his favorite comment, and I remember it so well, geez, geez, he always brought that in when he was trying to piece together the story. Receiving those SMS messages when we were traveling, saying and asking, where are you now? Enjoying the favorite macaroni, only made like mom did. Sorry, Anne, never quite got it right. Experiencing firsthand his pastoral care. Teach us, O oh Lord, to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. When Trevor died, I was doing which was something which most of us have been doing during lockdown. I was watching a movie on Netflix, and the film was called Don't Look Up. The film echoes much of what we have lived through, not only during this past two years, but a long, for a long time in this country. It's a sarcastic statement on life today. Denial of scientific evidence by those who have no scientific background. The ineffective political class too concerned about their own careers to think clearly about what needs to be done to save lives. A society that is too slow to react to danger because its attention is preoccupied with celebrating gossip and upbeat entertainment. But the film really helps us to think about the way we all face death. And I guess for me it's become a reality because I am now 70 years old and uh, we don't know how many more years we've got left in our lives. But it makes us think about death and the prospect of death, this movie, and its pending threat. Perhaps inevitability is the right word because we each find a way of dealing with death. Some of us despair. Some of us in many ways look at our lives and we say to ourselves, wait a minute, I'm happy to accept it. Some of us find a way to fight it, to conquer it, and even to defeat it. But we have to deal with it. And sometimes when we deal with it, we deal with it to the detriment of others. Sometimes we choose to ignore, preferring to be distracted by entertainment. At other times, we deny it and think that this can only happen to someone else, and we choose to ignore it. Don't look up, says the movie. I could hear Trevor saying, wait a minute, guys, and dolls, wait a minute. Look up, look down, look in front of you, look behind you, look sideways, look within, look underneath, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Our visit coincided with the death of the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. On Boxing Day, life will always be a boxing match and a struggle for us. And particularly Gavin and I, as we walked away from the home, conscious of how we felt. The secret is to think out of the box. Trevor John Ruthenberg, the Ruth, 
taught us respect. He disclosed the unusual. He encouraged us to think and make us feel at home. Rest in peace, my brother. Your spirit lives on. For the psalmist says, teach us, O Lord, to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for a remarkable friend. Jenny is going to make the commendation, and then the superintendent minister of Trevor's circuit will set the tone and take our thoughts literally beyond these four walls. In the middle there, that's okay. Then Neil can follow me. So I'm going to say the words of the commendation and then hand over to Reverend Neil Fels, uh, in between which we will sing the Lord's Prayer. So if you would like to stand for the words of the commendation. Let us pray. Merciful God, you have made us all and given your Son for our redemption. We commend our brother, Trevor John, to your perfect mercy and wisdom, for in you alone we put our trust. Amen. Friends, won't you please be seated? So Anne and Paul and Wesley and Glynis, family and friends gathered here today, I greet you and I offer you our deepest condolences, not just from myself, uh, but also on behalf of the Cape West Coast Circuit, where Trevor spent his last years as a supernumerary. But then also greetings and condolences from the district and the connection. One of the strengths of this church, in spite of sometimes being a lonely place, is that we are connected in many surprising ways. Our journey as ministers takes us in many different directions, and we find that being in full connection really does mean being connected to each other. And so as I said earlier, my presence here today doesn't represent just the circuit. Uh, I stand here on behalf of the district and bring apologies from our bishop, Reverend Yvette Moses. Uh, she's unable to be here today because of attendance at bishops' meetings in Joburg. Uh, and likewise, I also represent the connection, uh, even as uh, presiding bishop Purity Malinga and general secretary Michelle Hansrod send their greetings and condolences by way of this tribute. And so they sent this last night as a letter. The Methodist Church of Southern Africa dips its flag in honor of one of the sons of our African soil, 
as well as one of Mr. Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Movement's preachers, the Reverend Dr. Trevor Ruthenberg. Trevor was first and foremostly a devoted and committed follower and disciple of Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior. It was this relationship that was the foundation of all he was and was to become. It was this relationship that also undergirded his ministry, especially in the MCSA. Trevor entered the Methodist ministry in 1976 and was sent to Rhodes University for his training. He was subsequently ordained at the 99th conference of the MCSA held in 1981 in Grahamstown and presided over by the Reverend Dr. Simon Kabule as the president of conference. In his years of active ministry, he was to serve in various circuits throughout the connection, amongst others, 11 years on the East Rand, 17 years here at the Parrot Church, which were of the happiest and most fulfilling years of his ministry, three years in Maffa King, and finally seven years at Thornton, his home society, where he retired in 2016 after an active ministry spanning three decades. Trevor was a perpetual student who, after attaining his undergrad qualifications, furthered his studies and was an, awarded an honors and master's degree and finally a PhD from the University of South Africa. His deep humility, which characterized Trevor's life, never allowed him to boast about his academic achievements, as is so often the case. Instead, he used his knowledge to equip and empower others. Despite the titles he held, he would remind you that I am simply Trevor and not my titles. The key characteristics of Trevor's ministry was his deep humility, his gentleness, kindness, and caring as a pastor, a wise sage, and a soft-spoken yet formidable preacher. Trevor, by nature, was an introvert and someone who did not often speak. But when he did, especially on matters that he felt passionate about, he would speak and everyone would listen attentively to the wisdom he would share. As an elder colleague and brother in ministry, Trevor was deeply loved and respected by all he came into contact with. He was to serve as a mentor to generations of student or young ministers appointed to serve alongside him and was a trusted confidant to those who are of his generation in ministry. During his ministry at Paro, he offered special pastoral care to our former president of conference, Reverend Abel and Frieda Hendricks, following their sad loss of their only son. Both deeply appreciated his care and held him in high regard until their lives end. His passing will definitely leave a void in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa and will be fondly remembered by the people of this connection. We thank you, Anne, and your boys for sharing him with us, often at great cost to your family life. Trevor, we salute you and give thanks to God for your life and work and ministry even as we offer our sincere, sincerest and deepest condolences to you and your sons and the Ruthenberg family. Rest in peace, dear Trevor, and rise in glory. Friends, I said earlier that the world is a smaller place through our connections with one another. As Yvette and I spent time with the family last week, we discovered that we, myself, and the Ruthenberg family share some history at Springs, uh, Anne and myself both grew up there, and as an adult, she and her family attended the same medical practice that we went to as kids. Uh, and indeed, my childhood doctor helped her give birth. Uh, so I'm sure that may, there are many more of these coincidental connections with other members of clergy. As we journey forward from this moment, and I pray that these connections gathered through a lifetime of ministry across this beautiful country, uh, as you reminisce over them with others, will encourage you in the ongoing journey. So Anne and family and friends, as we have spent time today remembering Trevor and those funny stories and celebrating his life and his spirit, uh, 
we recognize that we are also here to say goodbye and to begin, only begin, the process of moving to a new phase of the journey which will be filled with sadness and grief, uh, but one I hope which will also be filled with joyful memories, even as you remember together with others who knew Trevor and shared in the journey. And so in that spirit, we commit Trevor's remains back to the elements. I invite the congregation to stand, please. And so for as much as our brother has departed out of this life, we therefore commit his body to the elements, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, trusting the infinite mercy of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I heard a voice from heaven saying, From henceforth blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. May we pray. So merciful God, our heavenly Father, who made your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the resurrection and the life, raise us, we pray, from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, that when we depart this life, we may with this, our brother, be found acceptable to you for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Friends, as we remain standing, we are going to sing our closing hymn, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest, lay down, thou weary one, lay down, thy head upon my breast. Just one verse. First verse. First verse. You have given us joy through the lives of your departed servants and especially through Trevor. We thank you for them and for our memories of them. We praise you for your goodness and mercy that followed them and followed Trevor all the days of their lives and for their faithfulness to the tasks to which you called them. We thank you that for them the tribulations of this world are over and death is past. Amen. So friends, I invite you to share in the grace with one another. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. In terms of leaving the building, how are we doing that? Would we leave out the front of the church? Past the the hall, and then out through that way. And so friends, I'd invite you to remain standing as the family leaves, and then you may follow afterwards.